We are exceedingly privileged <laughs> to have you uh, all here from so far away. <laughs> this is a first <laughs> for me. Uh, to have people fly in to do this and then fly back out. So it's wonderful though. Uh, thank you for including us uh, in this. And I'm, I'm glad for your persistence. Because even when he first emailed, I responded and said, well, you know, <laughs> we could use Zoom and be there in South Korea with you. But he was very determined to come here. So uh, that, that's amazing. And uh, uh, Michael Booney, who is our uh, founder and president of the NACM, uh, called me a little, or texted me a little bit ago and said, please take lots of photos. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he was glad to hear it was being videotaped, so thank you for that. Uh, is, is it Andrew? Chris, no, Christian. Christian, yeah. oh, I should remember that. That's my son's middle name, too. So. Well, wonderful. Well, let's pray and invite uh, the one that we're all guests here for and uh, ask the Lord Jesus Christ to bless our time. We thank you, Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, for this opportunity to come together and to carry out the ministry that you want to do, not just to Pastor Yesong and Yun and Young Wong, but to all of us as well. It's just an honor to be able to join in another brother and another minister's calling and affirmation of that calling. Just like was done in the New Testament with Paul's tradition of laying on of hands and commissioning young ministers as the apostles did into ministry to confirm and affirm them in their calling. So we ask your blessing on this time now. It's not what has been prepared by me or anyone else, but it's you we look to. I pray that this would be a special time and a special anointing of your spirit would rest upon our brother. And then as he goes back to uh, Seoul, Korea, uh, South Korea tomorrow, that that blessing will continue, Lord, to affect and influence him in his ministry in all the years ahead. <clears throat> So we thank you for this time, Lord, to, uh, to affirm what you are doing and uh, have done. And we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It was uh, only, what's it been, three months ago, maybe two, where uh, uh, Brother Jeffrey contacted me and wanted laying on of hands. Uh, and we did that not very long ago. Or am I... I may not be capturing time well, <laughs> but it seems as I get older, I, you know, things still seem like they happened yesterday. <laughs> but uh, so we had the joy of doing that. It was just the two of us because COVID restrictions were still in place. So it was just uh, Jeffrey and myself over at uh, his uh, church where the Kenyan uh, Christians meet in their fellowship there in Federal Way. So it's nice to have you with us too, brother. So let's, uh, let's take a moment to introduce ourselves a little more formally. Uh, and so I'll start by introducing uh, Pastor Yusung. And he, Pastor, you can introduce your elder and your deacon. Uh, and then uh, I'll ask you guys to introduce yourselves as well. And, you know, not a long introduction, but just to briefly share what your ministry involvement is in that. I know we've probably covered that already. Uh, Pastor. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess I'm co with the National Association of Christian Ministers Spain. Above all, I glorify God who has led all my life, and I couldn't have done my ceremony without the grace of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I thank all attendees, Reverend Roger Meyer, Reverend Steve Paul, Reverend Ruth Sterling, Mr. Jeffrey Kinua, mm -hmm. the staff of Christian, Elder Yen Lin at Seoul Bible Church and Ikon Yong Lin at the same church. I especially appreciate Roger Meyer who has prepared this ceremony. Thank you. And 
Also, I give thanks to my mother, Evangelist Yonga Lin, and Survival Church, and my sister, Chief Musician, Yang Ko, at the same church, who have helped me to be a pastor. Originally, they were to come with me to the ceremony, but they must leave the church when I cannot attend, so they couldn't attend today's ceremony. Again, I appreciate their endeavors, and I also thank the congregation of Seoul by Church. I glorify and thank God again, and I give thanks to all who have made efforts related to this ceremony. Today, I'm happy and pleased because I'm ordained by National Association of Christian Ministers, which is a non-denominational Christian organization. My church, Seoul Bible Church, is also non-denominational and located in Yeouido, in central Seoul. My church aims to help people who cannot repay as Luke mentions about preaching the gospel, chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. For example, we invite persons with disabilities and enable them to experience what is difficult for them to do, such as going to the amusement parks, theaters, and restaurants. In addition, we visit organizations related to the cultural families and single Family, uh, single parent families, and we provide opportunities for them to learn Bible and music. Also, we sponsor missionaries working in harsh areas where it is difficult to preach the gospel. My church tries to help those people as much as possible. I believe that showing Jesus love is completed not only through preaching but also through action. <coughs> My church, Seoul Bible Church, was established by my father. He graduated from Baptist Theological Seminary in Korea and was ordained by the Korean Baptist Church. He established Seoul Bible Church in 1990, and my church has now been open for about 30 years. And now I'm serving my church as the second and current church leader. The elder sitting here has attended Seoul Bible Church for 30 years, and the deacon has attended for 25 years. As for me, I was taught Bible by my father, and after I decided as a middle school student to be a pastor, my father trained me to be a good pastor and taught me about the overall ministry. For this reason, I have trusted, um, I have learned and believed that the church should be based on the Bible and doctrines made by people. I have trusted the congregation that the laws of the denominations to govern each church. This is the reason that I do my pastoral work at a non-denominational church. In terms of my educational history, I received a Bachelor of Theology degree from Methodist Theological University in Korea and a Master's degree from King's College London. After I entered the Theological Seminary in Korea, I worked as an evangelist at the church. Then I went to London to study abroad. However, three months after I went to London, my father was suddenly hospitalized with a cerebral hemorrhage. So I returned to Korea immediately. Ten days later, my father passed away. He was a healthy man, so nobody expected this situation. The whole congregation, including my family, was very sad. We were quite sorrowful because he did his pastoral work at one church. And he had taught the church members for a long time. In this circumstance, the congregation unanimously elected me as the church leader. At the time, I was confused about whether I would have to quit my studies in London to focus on pastoral work. However, thankfully, my mother told me she would leave the church while I studied in London, and the congregation also wanted me to finish the master's Finally, by the grace of God, I received a degree at King's College London. In addition, I visited many denominational churches during my studies in London. Unlike Korea, England has many kinds of churches, and I could learn about a wide range of worship styles and sermons, how to communicate with the congregation and systems of fees. The time I lived in London, the time I lived in London was a very memorable experience. 
Then I came back to Korea and I could focus on my passport work. The one thing I needed to proceed was ordination. As I mentioned, I don't agree with ordination by denomination. And although there are few non-denominational organizations in Korea, they require joining their group and the church must follow its rules. For these reasons, I prayed for my ordination for a long time and God gave me an inspiration in building in the United States. I knew that U.S. Christian society accepts many kinds of denominations and many non-denominational groups too. I tried to find non-denominational organizations. Finally, I found the National Association of Christian Ministers and I realized that the confession of the faith of this Christian organization is based only on the Bible and NACM guarantees each pastor's independent ministry. For this reason, I chose National Association of Christian Ministers and NACM approved my application. I thank the NACM elders who examined my application and chose me. Today, being ordained by NACM confers on me the title of pastor. I am I'm returning to Korea to my pastor work. I glorify God who has had all the processes of ordination and I want to give thanks to all who, who celebrate my ceremony. I will live as a pastor preaching the Bible and I will lead many people to God, helping them to repent and be faithful Christians. No matter what difficulties I face in death, I will live as a servant of God in my life. Furthermore, as a church, as a leader of the church, by leading the congregation, I will do my best to complete the church that Jesus wants. Please pray for my pastoral work in my life. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Before we, as we prepare for the time to lay on hands uh, with Pastor, and um, I ask that uh, uh, Steve. Uh, Steve, say a word about yourself, if you would, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to have uh, Ruth and, and Jeffrey do that as well. Well, I'm Steve Hall, and uh, I don't have any prepared message that would be like yours, Pastor Lee. So that was a wonderful, marvelous testimony. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, our Christians go back to the 1500s in France and England and then came here in the 1600s. But I didn't want to become a Christian until um, God just grabbed my soul in when I was a junior in college back in 1970. And then in 1976, a thought came into my mind that for the rest of my life I was supposed to help pastors throughout the Northwest know more about Christ, love Christ more, experience revival and their congregations experience a fresh love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so since 1976, I've been trying to do that wherever I can, to talk to pastors about the magnificence of Christ and to bring them together to pray. So I'm with a ministry out of uh, Multnomah Bible College that brings pastors together for two or three or four days just to experience more and more of God and to love each other through that fresh love for one another. Um, I could say a whole lot more. Oh, and uh, about six years ago, I had the privilege of, to begin going to the Philippines to talk to groups of pastors and in prisons and churches and wherever we could uh, about the greatness of Christ. So that's a joy for me to do that too. But I've been asked, am I going to read now? Uh, let me have uh, Ruth and, and Jennifer share about okay. themselves more, right. and I'll have to do that if you would. Thank you. Thanks. Well, just a quick introduction. I live here in South Seattle, and I, I have not lived here my whole life. I actually moved to Asbury, Kentucky, where I studied for my Master's of Divinity. Um, I was ordained in 1993, and Roger and I actually met uh, via the internet um, long ago, or not long ago, but a year and a half ago, and uh, we both had attended the same seminary, um, but today I returned, I pastored for uh, 
10 years in Michigan, five years in Seattle, and I returned back to Seattle in 2007, and I have three children, three teenage girls, and so I'm, I'm parenting them right now with my husband, and uh, today I am using my pastoral skills throughout the Northwest right now, and actually online, etc. cetera, you, uh, teaching leadership skills to pastors, and um, to others, I'm a life coach, so I work a lot one-on-one -on -one with people and just enjoy doing ministry in lots of different varieties. So, thank you. Thank you. So, once again, um, my name is Adiofri Kinyua. Uh, let me put it this way. I'm so glad and I feel very much privileged. Um, I was born in Kenya. And then I moved to the U.S. like uh, 11 years ago. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I got saved back in 1970 when I was in high school. You know, sometimes when I start in front of people, uh, they mistake about my age because I look young. But God has called me in the ministry of children. So that is why I got God. God has been using me, uh, but I owe it all to my mother. I was born in the Presbyterian uh, ministry where my mom was a church elder. And uh, you know, sometime you know, during the youth, I kept running away from God. But yet God was calling me, I need you, I need you here, I need you here. So the time I realized that God has called me into the children's ministry was 2002. Then I stopped working in other ministries like in men. I, then I focused strictly in, the, um, in, in serving the children. Right now, as I stand here, just as I said, I owe it all to my mom. Right now, she's 104 years old. And uh, she, you know, she keeps on encouraging me, sir, 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 because God has called us. So, I went to college back home. I got I had a diploma in uh, Christian counseling. Uh, here, uh, I did my, my bachelor's uh, class at uh, in, a, in a college that is in Texas, Baptist, a landmark Baptist uh, seminary. Now, I did my master's class, and uh, of course, recently I submitted my thesis for my doctorate in biblical Christian counseling. So. This gentleman, how did I connect with the uh, NACM? Uh, I felt that God was prompting me to, uh, to, you know, to go fully into the ministry. So I, I, I said this to my church. As I minister at Grace Covenant Church, we are on 288th at Federal Way. So I said, now um, I, want, I want to be ordained back in a non denominational uh, perspective. So I looked around then, then I, I came across, just as you said, I looked at, uh, then I came across uh, NACM. And of course, then I submitted my application to support them, there was no turning back. So today, my, today is another opportunity because uh, now I'm seeing an opportunity for me to visit South Korea, right? <laughs> I will visit your church. <laughs> so now, because now I have a new friend, I have a new member of the family in the ministry of the Lord, and that's how we, we do outreach. When you meet, then you know each other, because God has called us to serve, and to serve and to bear the fruits, because that's what the word of God says. Now, my encouragement to you, because I will not have an opportunity to come back and give you a word, is this. Serve the Lord, and don't look back. Keep going, keep going. God will encourage you, God will strengthen you, and there is joy in serving God. That's all that I encourage you. So, this gentleman is a great friend of mine, and uh, we are always in contact with one another. So, I'm glad that uh, this event is taking place in this church. If you did not get an, I mean, an opening in this church, then have taken place in my church at Federal Way. So congratulations. <laughs> you came you, you came first. <laughs>
Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> now, Brother Steve, uh, could you read that passage from Luke for us? Yes, I will do that. Thank you. <laughs> one of my very favorite passages is the one I've been asked to read. Luke 4, 14 to 21. And I can just picture this happening. Oh, man. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's faith. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying, to them. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow, they just probably fell down and worshipped you. I would anyway. <laughs> and the other passage is from Acts. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Yes. It's from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mahanan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Well, both these passages are, are important. <clears throat> And there's so much more we, we could read that's pertinent to what we're doing here today. Um, and like Steve, uh, that Luke 4 passage is one of my favorite. Because Jesus obviously was the model of ministry. And that passage, and isn't it remarkable just hearing uh, you read that again, how, you know, he didn't aforetime say, now I want Isaiah. <laughs> I want that passage from Isaiah. But they just handed him the scroll, already open to that. And of course, they could have handed him any Old Testament prophet because he fulfills them all. But what a remarkable, just after he'd been out in the wilderness and tested, you know, I, I thought it was interesting when I looked at this, <clears throat> that uh, it said in the beginning he was full of the Holy Spirit and he was led by the Spirit then into the wilderness. No. First he's full of the Holy Spirit, and then he's led by the Spirit into his testing. No. And then the remarkable, when he passes the test, uh, he comes back, returned in the power of the Spirit. That's just remarkable. No. But what an illustration of what we need. And then, everywhere he taught, everyone glorified him. There's a there's a process there, and I, I think the hardest part of that process is the testing part. <laughs> I don't like that particularly, but suffering is part of God's plan in molding us to be more even, used of Him more. No. But I, I want to start by saying that the Luke 4 passage, to me, reveals the character, not just what to do, but Jesus' character and the character we hope to have as ministers and leaders. Um, sometimes we get more focused about stuff, <laughs> programs, uh, you know, new techniques, new methods. And it always brings back to mind a wonderful Christian by the name of E.M. Bounds. I don't know if you've heard of this gentleman. I think he was early 1900s, late 1800s, somewhere in there. <laughs> Tremendous books. Uh, I was a young Christian when I stumbled across The Power of Prayer by E.M. Bounds. Uh, that book humbled me. 
But he, I want to quote him about the kind of thing that we're looking for and is needed today in our churches is character, the character of Jesus. The character of Jesus turns more hearts to him than all the sermons uh, and, you know, because those things have to come from uh, that character. In, in one of the courses I do online, we talk about that, uh, we talk about how it was the person of Jesus that affected people. You, know, you may have met him and then walked away and kind of forgot nine-tenths of the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> All the wonderful things he said, which were profound and insightful. Yeah. But no one met Jesus and walked away from him uh, unaffected. It was his person, his character, his nature. I mean, when we talk about going to heaven, what are you looking forward to? Streets of gold, pearl gates, <laughs> uh, amazing liquid river, whatever that's going to be. <laughs> I only want one thing. <clears throat> like Job said, uh, when worms have destroyed this body, I want to stand before him with my own eyes. I will see him. You know? I, that's our desire. So E.M. Bounds said, the church is always looking for better methods, but God is looking for better men and women. <laughs> You know, or better ministers. You know. God's plan is to make much of the man, the minister, far more of him than anything else, because men are God's method. What the church needs today is not more machinery, devices. That's pretty good for a word for back in the early 1900s. Machinery or, or better uh, machinery, not new organizations or novel methods but men whom the Holy Ghost can use because they're men of prayer. The Spirit of God does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come upon machinery, but on men. He does not anoint programs, but men, men of prayer. Those are just profound. <laughs> profound things that, that we never want to forget. So how does Jesus show the character of ministry? in this passage. First he says, I came to proclaim good news to the poor. Now that sounds more like a what than a how. But, uh, but behind that is, and we know the Gospels, and we know his compassion. He was continually moved with compassion. And who received him the most? The rich, the Pharisees, or the common people? Common people, right? They heard him gladly, it says. So Jesus, matter of fact, he wouldn't play the Pharisees' game. Yeah. The Pharisees were more interested in those with money to come to church because you got better offerings. You know, years ago when I was called to ministry and Native ministry, especially working with Native American Indian people here in the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, most Native people do not have money. <laughs> most uh, are, are live at or below poverty level. But the gentleman who was our superintendent through that particular denomination I won't mention, but he actually sat us down as new church planters. And I came to Seattle to start a Native American church in Seattle. That was my commission um, as a cross-cultural missionary worker. <clears throat> but, and the guy, the gentleman was a Native American himself, but he did not grow up on the reservation. He grew up uh, on the other side of the tracks, as they say. But he told me, Roger, when you go to Seattle, I want you to target middle class native people. They were really hard to find. <laughs> but he told me, I want you to, because you'll never build a church targeting poor people. I actually was astounded when I heard that. And we didn't do it. <laughs> actually, there were two families out of our small fellowship of native people that actually owned homes and had jobs. And, and they were el elderly folks and they've been doing it a long time. One was a commercial fisherman here in Seattle and the other worked for Boeing <laughs> uh, for 40 some years. He was Navajo and uh, the other uh, family was uh, from Southeast Alaska. Um, oh, that's terrible. Not Clinton, but the other guys. Haida, <laughs> Haida, Haida Indians. Anyway, most of the folks that came to our little fellowship were struggling to keep work, 
renting places and struggling to meet that. And, and some came to Christ. But you know, we always had enough. Me and my family, as pastor and family, we always had enough. You know, we were living in small rental places, but you know, it was enough. You know. And, uh, and the people we got to minister to and lead to Christ and see their lives change before us, it was enough. You know. But I just say that to, that doesn't mean we have to necessarily try to be poor. <laughs> but it means we need to have compassion on the least of these, as Jesus put it. Those are the folks that are in need. <clears throat> when I was planting that church, at the same time there was a young name, man by the name of Jeffrey Smith. <clears throat> And Jeff was starting a church in Bellevue. Matter of fact, with the same organization I was part of. Uh, now he was a white fellow and he was uh, seeking to reach predominantly white, well-off families. So he rented a, uh, the common room at the Red Lion Inn, a kind of upper crust hotel there in Bellevue, down by the highway there. And so he started his meetings, but he, had, he made sure he had a band and he played saxophone himself. So he had a nice band and he took contemporary music. And uh, I never really attended the church, but I knew Jeff pretty well because we was part of some meetings we had. And so for about six years, he had an upscale kind of meeting at the hotel every Sunday. And he got uh, about 30, 40 folks coming. And they were all well-off families. But in the process, Jeff shared with us later when his church collapsed, he shared at a meeting, he was very humble, and he said, here's what happened. I didn't preach the gospel because I knew it would offend them, but I wanted to keep them coming. So I figured once they're coming and there, I'd start giving them more gospel. <laughs> well, he got frustrated himself, so he started giving them a lot of gospel and they left. <clears throat> you just can't do that. So we have to have the compassion of Jesus uh, for the down and outer. Uh, even if it doesn't look lucrative, you know, using basic financial understanding and principles. You know. uh, but I know one thing, even if you do that and you minister to those that God brings before you and you reach out to the ones that, that are without, that are struggling in life. They're the ones that want to hear the gospel. They're the ones more likely to listen to the gospel. You can still build a church. God can build his church with those folks. I always think of uh, communist China. When I was a young Christian, I read a little tiny paperback book called The Jesus People in Communist China. It was one of the best things I ever read. And it's about the underground church because, you know, communism punished people for becoming Christians. But it was one of the most strongest thriving churches. It met underground and the uh, government officials were always looking for them, trying to shut them down, but they couldn't. And it just grew. Those people would get up at 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning, meet together and have a tremendous worship time. Then they would go out into the neighborhoods and help people on their farms. And they were fairly poor themselves. And they go out and just give people a hand in whatever they needed. Then they came back late evening and man did they worship. Because <laughs> they saw God do so much. So we have to have this compassion of Jesus. Number two, he said, proclaim liberty to the captives. To me that speaks of having a transformational ministry. What that means is we know people are changing. I heard a guy recently, a Bible teacher, he said, if you've been preaching for four, five, six years, hundreds of sermons, but you know the people in the pews, and they basically are still behaving the same way they were six years ago, something's wrong. You may bring great sermons, good messages, but if we're not discipling, if we're not really involved with their lives, and we're seeing real change take place, then the Spirit is being somehow stifled. Because the evidence of, well, you know, the, the, what is it, in 2 Corinthians, Paul put it this way, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty. 
So if God is really being given freedom in a church and through its leaders, people will be experiencing more and more freedom from the stuff of their past. I always picture Christians like, if you can imagine a stone archway here, you know, kingdom of God in here, right? Most Christians come with all kinds of suitcases, backpacks, and everything. They, they meet Jesus and they go through that. They're now in the kingdom, right? Some of that luggage falls off, but most of us have a bunch we carry in with us. <laughs> That's why we need preachers, pastors, ministers, teachers, evangelists, uh, mentors, uh, disciples, because we need help getting rid of that baggage. Our God loves us so much. I, you ever hear this? I love this. God loves us uh, so much. He accepts us just as we are. But he loves us so much, he will not leave us as we are. I love that. So our God is one of transformation. He's interested in change. He isn't interested in us plateauing, you know, staying at a certain place good enough, you know. And of course, as Christians, we sometimes get into that, right? Looking at other Christians and say, well, I'm not like him. You know, at least I'm not doing that anymore, <laughs> you know. But that's not... They're a healthy comparison, right? We are motivating people to constantly experiencing the freedom and the transformational aspect of being a Christian and being in Christ. Then, Jesus said, recovering of the sight to the blind. Now we know he healed a lot of blind people physically when he was here. He healed lame people, he cast demons out. Uh, he did a lot of healing. <clears throat> but this, I think, is also a little bit metaphorical in that he also brought new insight. He took the blindness, the spiritual blindness for people and showed them God's truth about who he was, who God really is, about their lives, about sin and how it's detrimental to their lives, how they could have the kind of life he was exhibiting in front of them. So we're to uh, bring insight, life-changing insight. When I was a young minister, uh, I was looking through materials, I can't remember where I found this, but, you know, there were suggestions that pastors how to file their sermons, you know, every week, and so that eventually you could go back and preach some of those old ones again, and they would never know it. <laughs> but I remember that saying, that doesn't sound right. It should be fresh, you know. Uh, if we're growing, we teach out of what we're growing in, in Christ. And that has profound effect on others. But if I'm not growing, if I'm not gaining new insights, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my 70th, I never thought I'd get there. I'm in my 70th year of life on this planet. I've been following Christ for now 50 years of that. Uh, I feel like a babe. <laughs> I'm just understanding things now that I wish I would have known 50 years ago, 40 years ago. I'd like to retread. I want to go back <laughs> and start again, but uh, don't get to do that. But, you know, there's so much to know, so much to learn. Even some of the basic things that I could quote, you know, uh, when I sat in one seminary course by a wonderful Bible teacher, he put John 3.16 up on the chalkboard. Now we all seminarians knew John 3.16 forwards and backwards. And then he proceeded to speak for the next hour, tearing that verse, breaking it down into its components. And I literally looked around the room and all of us were sitting there like this. <laughs> Our jaws were hanging down we're like, wow, I never saw that before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he had a remarkable ability. He's very famous for his teaching too, uh, in some circles. Not so much on the popular TV circuit, but uh, he had an amazing ability to be an inductive Bible teacher. He knew how to take verses and help you really understand the nuances of all the truths that were in them. <clears throat> so we have to be fresh ourselves. We have to keep fresh. You know, I find that, especially with this COVID thing and all that, uh, the one thing I've noticed is I kind of feel stale. I was really afraid of doing this today. I thought, Lord, I haven't preached a message or anything for 
I was really quite afraid, you know, uh, because this whole thing has made me kind of dull. And uh, it's not good, you know. We have to stay fresh. We have to stay invigorated and plead to the Lord to help us when they, times are challenging and it's hard to do that. And then he said lastly, well, almost lastly, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. I used to wonder, what's the difference between that verse and proclaiming liberty to captives? No. Jesus obviously distinctly separated those two things. Um, and I thought of oppression. Now, he was speaking to Israelites under Roman rule, right? Who were being oppressed by the Roman government. But... And there were, of course, even the disciples at times said, when are you going to overthrow these Romans so we can be truly free? No. He said, you don't understand the freedom I'm trying to bring. It's a different freedom and a different oppression. The oppression is our sin. That's the freedom I've come to give. Freedom from the oppressiveness of, our, of sin and what it does to us. So what I get from this in character is that Jesus was saying, you cannot minister to people at arm's length. I try not to get into being critical of church today, but we have, in America, we have fallen into a pulpit-centered church idea. Audience sits here, performers up here. It's, you know, even small churches have fallen into that mentality. It's an academic kind of setting. It's like classroom on Sunday morning. It's a lecture hall. You come, you sing a few songs, and you worship, hopefully, and, and yet <clears throat> the predominant period uh, of time is given to an oration, a speech. It better be good if you want them to come back next Sunday. <laughs> so, but it all centers around it. That's part of it. And it's obviously in the book of Acts and that, that this is what, an important part of preaching and teaching, but it wasn't everything. Between those times of preaching and teaching, a lot of mentoring and discipling was going on. People were involved with each other and in their lives. Elderly people who had known Christ and matured in Him were involved with younger Christians. Deliberately. And the pastor was one who made sure this was happening. A pastor cannot mentor 20, 30 Christians. He can't do it. But a pastor can train other mentors. I think of the passage where Paul says, of the things you have heard of me in front of these witnesses, turn around and teach those also to others who are faithful, so they in turn will you know, teach others. In other words, disciple. You know, uh, the mature Christians should have a hunger to get involved with the younger Christians and be there for them. Because we don't... Teaching is informational. Discipling is incorporation, it's application. Uh, it's like the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, riding along, was it Philip, right? Uh, that uh, came up to him and said, do you understand what you're reading in, this, in the scroll? He said, no, how can I, except the man help me? <laughs> so this one speaks to me, setting at liberty those who are oppressed of involvement, rolling up your sleeves and really getting involved. We cannot minister at a distance. The distance between a pulpit and your audience is too far. And we've developed that, sadly, to our own detriment. It's why, at least in America, when you ask most young people why they're not coming to church, that's what they'll point to. It's just a message. It's just, no one cares if I'm there. I duck in, I duck out. I don't, it doesn't meet my needs. I don't feel love. I don't feel interest. I don't feel someone coming alongside me. And that's part of discipleship too. I give you an example from the NACM. We have a brother, Freewater, uh, Nathaniel Issa. He's in Nigeria. He's one of our elders. He's our elder for Nigeria. And you know what's happening in Nigeria, I'm sure you've heard. The persecutions are increasing uh, between killing pastors, kidnapping their children, cutting off heads, all kinds of horrible stuff 
by the Islamic uh, activists there, uh, the Fulani. So I've been in touch with Brother Freewater because we're, we're very close. And uh, when this first started to happen in northern Nigeria, many Christians were fleeing to the south to avoid this. We contacted Freewater and said, what will it take to get you out of that country? Uh, and at first he was asking, him, can you help me? I need to get out of here for my, his daughters you know, and a wife. And uh, they were kidnapping and killing Christian ministers especially. So we did a GoFundMe. We raised some funds. And by the time we had it raised, uh, Freewater contacted me and said, I'm not leaving. Instead, he had, uh, see, he does a seminary there. He had a seminary. It's not there now. But he said, I can't leave these Christians behind. He said, they're coming to me. And they look to me for strength as a minister to them. I can't leave. I can't leave them behind just for my own safety and my family. So he's still there. <laughs> and uh, it's remarkable. But see, that's real empathy. That's really understanding the call to be involved, <clears throat> you know, to suffer with those who suffer, weep with those who weep. So, Lastly, uh, Jesus says, the last thing he says in that passage, he reads from it is, uh, today in your ears, you've heard this, today is the day of salvation. This is for today. I'm fulfilling this right now in front of you. And it just speaks to me of the other character of ministry is, we're never thinking much about the future. It's about what are we doing today? Are we making a difference now? Because there's people here that need to know Christ and know salvation now, right? It's so easy sometimes to make plans. Oh, we need a bigger building, and then we can do this, or we need a bigger program, and then we'll do that. <laughs> it's, yeah, as you guys know, the need right now is humongous. I I'm sure in South Korea the same. It's a huge need. People are lost. They're truly lost. In this country, they're looking to everything but Christ. And churches are trying to come up with new ideas. How do we reach these young people? Well, are you out there with them? Go where they are. Don't, you know, one thing we do in academia churches, we try to do programs here and say, hey, we got something for you over here. They're not going to come. They need to be Christians in the workplace, the marketplace, the neighborhood. That's where we connect. And then when they see there's something about you, where does that come from? Well, I have Jesus in my life. Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah, but the things you've heard are probably not good. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. And then when they see you, you're genuine and authentic, then they say, where do you get this from? Well, Sundays we meet over here. Wednesdays, or, you know. <clears throat> then, you know, they're interested to maybe come and see. So, skipping some of my many pages. <laughs> but I want to encourage you, uh, Yeso, and ourselves as well. Because, uh, frankly, sharing these things is very convicting to me. Uh, there's a lot of these things I need to implement again in my life in a fresh way. Like Steve said, there's a lot of Christians, I think, feeling that way these days. And uh, they know revival is greatly needed. True revival in Christ is needed these days. Because the way we've been doing church isn't working anymore. It works for already Christians, but it isn't drawing uh, others to Christ. Besides, church was never meant to be <laughs> the place for sinners to come and learn about God. No. Church was those who know Christ and coming together as that uh, weekly huddle, like a football game. It's a huddle where we get together and say, okay, what, what's the plan? 
Lord, what's the plan? What are we supposed to be doing here? And then we go out. Little church I used to attend in Tacoma, over their door, it said mission field. <laughs> so the when church is over, you go out the door, that's what you see. That's the doorway to the mission field out there, your home, your neighbors, you know, marketplace. Well, on that note, let me look at my notes. And uh, Pastor already uh, shared his testimony, and thank you for that. And uh, so let's pray, and we're going to take some time here to uh, lay hands on our brother and, uh, and confirm his calling and the Lord's anointing on him. Heavenly Father, thank you for the magnitude of being called. There's only one thing almost as great as knowing you and being saved, and that's being called by you into working cooperatively with you in a particular work, whether it's pastor, evangelist, uh, coach, uh, personal coach, uh, ministry to other ministers, children's ministry, no matter what it is, it's a calling. And it's life changing. And so we want to pray right now and have our brother come forward and uh, commission him, affirm his calling and his ordination in Jesus' name. Um, brother Yesa, if you would come, come up front here. And, uh, sure, yeah, that'd be fine. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so please come around, our fellow ministers here. And, uh, no, you're good, you're good. And I'm going to uh, initiate the praying, and uh, then I invite you, as you feel so led, uh, to pray for our brother. And I'm going to try not to muster your hair. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, in this moment, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for our brother, Yasun Ko, the calling you put on his life to be a pastor of the church of this old Bible church and all the ministries that go out from there. Heavenly Father, we ask you in this moment that through our laying on of hands and our prayers, that Father, you would anoint our brother that as he goes forth and goes back home to this ministry, it would flourish as never before. Not only in bringing many to Christ and knowing him, but in discipling, mentoring, and building into their lives the biblical principles of how to be a strong and, and reproductive Christian. So thank you for my brother, Lord. And I ask you now to Bless him and fill him with your Holy Spirit as he goes forward. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the life that is laid here before us. Lord, in the calling to sung and his, when you have called his name, even as you shared with us when he was in middle school, Lord, you knew his heart. You knew his future. And Lord Jesus, right now, we lay our hands upon you. Knowing, Lord, that it's you who anoints him for the ministry. It is you who calls him out and asks him to follow you the rest of the, his days. And Lord Jesus, I want to pray right now for your protection upon him as he returns to Korea. Lord, you have called him to do a ministry. Lord, we don't even understand what it is. But Lord, you know. And Lord, we pray that you would go before him, that you would open the doors, that you would... Bring the people, Jesus, that he is to minister to. And God, we are so thankful for the calling that you have on each of our lives. And that, that we don't take this calling lightly. But it's something in which it has transformed our, our minds and our hearts. And we pray to you son, that it will transform his. From this day forward, Lord, may you call him and set him apart for the ministry that you have called him to. And God, we thank you for that. We pray for your
Yehovah, we thank you. Thank you for this hour and, and this particular time, oh God. Thank you for the miles that has traveled for this occasion, oh Jehovah God. Thank you for that desire that you have planted in his heart, oh God. Thank you for the calling, Lord, that he can be able to serve your people, oh Jehovah God. We are so grateful as witnesses, Heavenly Father. Even as he goes out, Lord, I pray that he will go in your power. You will encourage him, O Jehovah God, that he will heal, he will mentor other people. He will change lives through the power of you, O Jehovah God. We are so grateful, Lord, that we are together, Heavenly Father. Even as he means that with your sheep, Lord, as a shepherd, Lord, encourage him. Strengthen him, O Jehovah God. There is so much that he is going to do on your behalf, O yes. Heavenly Father. We pray for the strength, for the courage. Amen. And of course, even when he is discouraged, O oh God, be on his side. Stand with him, Heavenly Father. Just as you stood with the Joshua, just as you yes. stood with the Moses, O Jehovah God, he will be there for you, Lord. He has offered himself, Lord, just to minister to your people, Lord. We are so grateful to witness this, O Jehovah God. Even as he will be traveling back, O oh God, to serve your flock. I pray that, Lord, you bless him in a mighty way, O Jehovah God. We pray this short prayer of faith, trusting and believing in your name. Yes. Amen. And Father, I, uh, as I've been thinking about this, this time today, I am strongly reminded of what uh, you told Moses to have Aaron pray over the people of Israel. And how, as I've studied, it's become one of the most remarkable prayers in the whole Word of God out of number six. The Lord bless you. And I pray for that, that for you, my brother. The Lord keep you. The Lord keep you. He wasn't just talking to the people of Israel, brother. He was talking to you, too. The Lord make his face, his holy, exalted, magnificent, loving face shine upon you. Yes. And be gracious to you. May he fill you with all the grace of the, of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes. The Lord turn his face upon you. He's looking at you. He's right there with you. He's never leave you or never forsake you. Yes. And give you peace. Amen. Lord, we pray that there would be that extraordinary in the midst of all the trials and tribulations and pressures and, and even, even the things that the enemy would come against him. Pray that he would fix his eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith. Oh, yes. That you would give him that perfect peace. Yes. Perfect peace. Yes. May he rest in you. May he be a lion, a champion yes. on the one hand. Yes. But may he, he, uh, he trust you to give him peace. Yes. Oh, yes. And Lord, I, I, I think of uh, in, in when Christ stepped out of, of, out of the Jordan River and the the Spirit was uh, uh, lighted on him as a dove. Um, he was he was uh, anointed, and, and Lord, we I think that as a disciple of Christ, as a follower of Christ, as an ambassador of Christ, this brother is is receiving the same Holy Spirit, and I, I just pray that uh, you would anoint him uh, with righteousness. Anoint him with love and mercy and grace and the full complement of the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let him go and do exceeding abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. Not for his glory, not for his pleasure, but for the glory of the house, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We love this brother already. I can just imagine how much you love him. May he go and, and make disciples for your sake. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> now in your bulletin, on the back cover, I'm just waiting for you. <laughs> Can we, let's uh, pray this prayer in unison if you would stand with me. And I thought it would be wonderful if we do the English sentence and if you and uh, your elder and deacon would speak the Korean after we do the English, you do the Korean? 
Oh, thank you. I want to hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, as those called into Christian ministry, by the will of God and confirmation of His Spirit, we renew our commitment to Jesus Christ. To abide in Him and be led by His Spirit. To faithfully speak His truth in love. Minister humbly in His compassion for all. Doing all only for the glory of His name. Amen. Thank you. Brother Steve, would you mind closing our time with prayer? I would love to. I'm trying to find the doxology. Oh. Yeah, we thought about music, but wasn't sure how we would do that. <laughs> in, isn't it in Romans 8? I can't remember. Praise God for all. Really Blessings flow with that. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh. Well, look. No, I can't. I'll just pray. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here. Father, uh, how good and pleasant it is to be your boys and girls, to be your children together. Thank you for all of what you have done in each of our lives to bring us here together. It just feels like family. I uh, thank you especially for you, son, and for his elder and deacon who are here. Um, I, I know that you have called them as you did ask for such a time as this. Um, thank you for their desire to love you and honor you and to uh, do what you said, to go and make disciples. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you would um, enable them to do uh, all that you have called them to do. Uh, I pray for extraordinary unity within their congregation, within their fellowship. I pray that the Spirit of God would uh, abide with them. I pray that they would love you and they and their congregation would love you with all of their hearts and soul and mind and strength and their neighbors as themselves and that those neighbors, those people that they are ministering the gospel to would would see Jesus in them, would be hungry to know you. And at the same time, Lord, I pray that the blood of Jesus would so cover and cleanse them that the enemy would have no access to them. He wouldn't be able to tempt them, harm them, or distract them. And I pray, Lord, that uh, your heavenly army would uh, overwhelm also the anything uh, of the enemy so that these dear people and many others who would join them would be a light on the hill. That they would be so filled with you on fire for you under your lordship that the gates of hell could not prevail. They would, and, and, and Lord, that uh, in the days and the weeks and the months to come as they travel back there, they would be filled with life, filled with joy, filled with hope. And that would, that would be infectious. That would, that would cause a tidal wave, like, like it said, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That there would just be a tsunami of life in Jesus. In fact, the, as the enemy comes to kill and steal and destroy, I have come that you might have life and life to the full. And Lord, I just want to close with that life to the full, that these dear people and those in their congregations and families would experience life to the full which would attract masses of people to you and to them.
Lord, isn't that a joy that this brother is now commissioned, anointed uh, pastor, one of your chosen pastors? And we ask these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> well, we do have a plan to uh, go from here to. Uh, this is why I live in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> it's also why I wanted to go to Alaska and stay there, but it didn't work out. I don't like hot weather. <laughs> But uh, we have, uh, we uh, thought the Chinook restaurant down in Salmon Bay at the Fisherman's Terminal would be a, a great place to have a meal together and continue the fellowship. So, uh, so we'll just uh, close this up and put things away and, uh, and then uh, we can talk about how we're going to get there. We